it's, it's a, about you know, seven uh, in Moscow. So seven, uh, yes. Let me see. We have we have some audience uh, came back. Maybe some more coming. So okay. let me start introducing you. I okay. have a long list of your achievements. Uh, but, but you can make it shorter, maybe. No, we shot, uh, but you are, uh, well, the people say in your CV that you are global inequality economist. Uh, mm -hmm. Sounds a bit strange. Uh, I would rephrase it as a professor who is more equal than others. Is it okay? okay? Well, that's interesting. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have a few books on inequality and a number of reward, uh, awards uh, for the books in 2011, 16, 18. Uh, you're uh, not just a visiting professor, but you're visiting presidential professor. It's yes, now, yes, that's uh, very important. We, de we definitely don't understand. We, we understand the uh, scope, but not uh, the, the details. So uh, you are uh, the professor Branko Milanovic, who is speaking for us today, is the, definitely one of the top uh, main, mainstream uh, economist is specifically on uh, inequality. So we are happy to have you in our conference uh, and your opinion on what's going on after all. Please. Okay, so well, first, thank you very much for actually for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be, to be there, I mean, virtually, as I suppose we all are these days. So as you know, from the uh, title of the presentation, first of course, I would like to, to thank Leonid again for, for the invitation. So for the title of the presentation, I would speak about the long run evolution of global income inequality and a little bit about the political meaning of global inequality. First of all, you know, very often when people, when we start uh, discussing global inequality, people ask me actually, obviously, what is global inequality? Because it's not, not immediately obvious what it means. So to define global inequality, uh, you know, very simply, let me just say, I'm writing the slide. Uh, I'm having some problem with the slides here now. Let me restart again. The sharing, I'm sorry for this. Yeah, it's sharing. okay. We understand that Trump lost elections, so nothing works anymore. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, let me try again. Okay. So the, Masha, Masha, my look here. Yeah. Давайте немножко подождем. Вообще Бранко говорил, что у него неустойчивая связь в связи с тем, Но, что... вот я тогда ничего не делаю, ты тогда как ты это делаешь? Окей, okay. you are back. <laughs> we don't have data on, on all individuals in the world, but we have the data from household surveys from most of the countries in the world, which then enables us to... We don't have you. Может быть, попросить видео выключить, а включить слайд, показывать Даже для того, чтобы это сказать, хорошо бы как-то взаимно услышаться. Бранко? Бранко, suggestion. Yes, right. Uh, to switch off uh, the picture to save energy. Yeah, I think that could be the reason, actually. But now I'm actually... Can you hear me now? Yes, it's okay. The footprint is fine. Yes, okay. I'm actually make, I'm saving some energy, as you said, actually, by not having the, the whole right. picture. Yeah. Right. So the, the graph that you can see now is the, the estimated global inequality from 1820 until today. The important part is that to realize that in the 19th century, global inequality has been rising permanently. And the reason is the industrial revolution and the fact that some countries, essentially Western Europe and uh, uh, North America became rich. 
their income levels went up and two other large parts of the world, China and India, actually remained at the same level of income or even went down. So this is basically, if you want to have kind of a shorthand uh, sort of idea what happens to global inequality, I think it's useful as a first approximation to think of three parts of the world. One is basically Europe and North America. The number two is China and the number three is India. And it's really the interaction of the three of them that determines essentially about 50% of the change in global inequality. So what you see here is that global inequality throughout the 19th century went up almost without stop. As I will show you in a minute, it was driven by two forces. One, as I said, was the fact that differences between the, these three groups, uh, the West, India, and China became much larger. And secondly, inequality within most of the countries, large countries, went up. So you really basically have two forces that push global inequality up. Increasing differences between the countries and increasing differences within the countries. Between Branko, the we lost your presentation. We don't see your presentation. You see we that, hear the, you, but we don't see your presentation. Okay, so let me then, let me try it again. Yeah, share, share screen again. Yes. That's what I was afraid that once I start, uh, you know, start. Don't uh, worry, don't worry. Okay. We will manage. But you can cut then later, right? Don't worry. We, you just give us your presentation and we and go on. No problem. You're probably pressing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let me. Can you see now the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So I'm not going. To... Okay, let me. I'm just afraid now of doing anything. No, no, no. Just move on. Okay, okay, okay. This is the... Yeah, we see. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is the slide that I was showing. So on this slide, you see global inequality from 1820. It was based on, as I mentioned before, on medicine's GDP per capita estimates and the estimates of uh, all the way to, to the latter part of the 20th century, 20th century on the estimates on inequality by Francois uh, Bourguignon and Christian Morisson. Then the la <coughs> go, let me go back. So essentially the 19th century was the increase of inequality driven by increased inequalities between countries and increased cleavage or inequality within. Now, if you look at the 20th century, you noticed actually that, gl that global inequality is an extremely high level. You notice that the Gini coefficient there is about 70, and but it doesn't change. There is really very little change in global inequality from basically World War I until probably 1990s. It's at a very high level, and that was the time, I'll mention that later, of the three worlds. And what was interesting in the three worlds, the first one being the world of rich capitalist countries, the second one, the world of socialist countries, and the third world was in the, um, uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. What was interesting is that these three worlds really in terms of average income had very little overlap. Uh, basically, most of the Western countries were richer than most of the socialist countries. Practically all socialist countries were richer than the countries of the third world, so you see the world had really very sort of a, a clear structure in that sense with very high level of inequality, mostly due to inequality uh, between countries. And then finally, and I will speak about that period much more in a minute, we have from the end of the last century, so that's already now 30 years, we have the period of the rise of Asia, which meant of course, prim primarily the rise of China and of now more recently of other countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, India, Thailand, and so forth, which being poor to start with and increasing at very high rates have really re reduced global inequality. So if I were to make this sort of a, a structure of global inequality, how it has changed over like last two centuries, I would actually say that what we have, we have three different periods. The first period of the 19th century with 
large increase of inequality. The second period in the 20th century with the uh, a very high inequality at a very high plateau. And the third period of reduced global inequality thanks to the rise of Asia. So I called it, as you see in the title, from Karl Marx to Franz Fanon and back to Marx. Now, why did I call it like that? Because in the first period of the 19th century, you also had rising inequalities within countries. So that's why I mentioned Marx. <clears throat> in the second period, I mentioned Franz Fanon, who was, uh, of course, a, a sort of a revolutionary writer expressing precisely the cleavage in the 20th century, that was the cleavage between the less developed countries and the most developed countries. So in that cleavage, as Fanon called it, called it, uh, the bourgeoisie of, of the world was really the West and the proletariat of the world were the countries of the third world, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So you notice that the original Marxist definition of, you know, split between the classes, which was always defined as within nation, in, in Franz, uh, Franz Fanon, and because of the large inequalities between different parts of the world, became a definition which was based on the place where you lived, on the country where you lived, no longer on the class. And then, of course, why I put Marx back to Marx, because, of course, increased inequalities within nation states that we now have practically in most countries are accompanied by the reduced inequality between, between countries, especially between China, India, US, and so forth. So that's how, you know, the, the, the change happened. The same story is then sort of can be shown on, on this slide, where the blue bar is the overall inequality between nations. So you see this blue bar going up very, very significantly throughout the 19th century, then staying at the very high level and then going down now thanks to China and in particular more recently thanks to India. The red bar or the orange bar shows inequality within nation states and those inequality have been rising throughout the 19th century and then essentially they've been more or less stable in the 20th century and now again they are going, going up. So this is basically the story of global inequalities in, uh, in two centuries. Now this is the same graph with the blue again showing the cleavages between nations. You notice this large increase in cleavages in gaps between the nations throughout the 19th century and the red bar shows the total extent of inequalities within countries. Uh, so let me then show you a little bit how we can actually use the same data uh, to look at the change in the world in terms of the um, in terms of poverty. Now, this is first graph to illustrate the resurgent Asia, which shows you the ratio between income, uh, GDP per capita in particular, between China, uh, uh, Indonesia, and India with respect to West European countries. So in this case, China and India are compared to the GDP per capita of Great Britain, and Indonesia is compared to the GDP per capita of the Netherlands. So you notice in all three cases, the decline of the Asian countries from the 1820, when our data start, all the way to the mid 20th century, when all three of them either went through a revolution or became independent. And then you see a rebound and significant increase in the position of the three countries, which Actually, if I were to update it, and I should actually update it for the most recent years, you have, will have this rebound to be even more important. So essentially, uh, global inequality shows you here uh, the effects first of the Industrial Revolution, which made the West richer and consequently increased the gap between the Western countries and everybody else. And now, in the last 30 years, it shows you the effects of the rise of Asia, which actually now is like a mirror image of what happened during the Industrial Revolution. During the Industrial Revolution, you had like what is in physics called the big boom. You had an explosion where some countries became very rich, others stayed where they were, and that created the distance. 
Now you have like a mirror image. You have uh, the countries that were formerly poor catching up and then reducing global inequality. So I don't want to uh, extend this an analogy too far, but let me notice that actually some of the effects that existed in the first industrial revolution, namely the industrialization of India because of the cheap textiles that were imported and then basically submerged India and Indian textiles, the, the cheap textiles which came from England, have a, an equivalent into in this deindustrialization today in the West. In other words, the industrialization of the West is the result of much cheaper products that are being produced in China and in the rest of Asia. So it's again a mirror image of what happened two centuries ago. And that mirror image, you can see it actually in the, the slides. Now, let me then show you differently the, the changes between the positions of China and uh, Western countries. So in this case, again, I'm using China and the UK or Great Britain as a comparator. Now, this graph is a little bit complicated. So let me lead you uh, step by step. Start with a blue line first and ignore all the other lines. On the horizontal axis here is the position uh, of each decile in income distribution. So uh, number 10 is the, would represent you the bottom decile in China and the UK. And on the vertical axis, you have the ratio between these two. So in other words, if I start on the blue line on the very top, you see the number, which is I think 40, which says that the in, and that, now, that blue line is from the year 1820. So it says that in 1820, the income of the bottom decile in China was equal to about 40% of the income of the bottom decile in the UK. So that's where the first point. And then you notice this blue line is going down. And actually that means that the second decile in China had an income which is only 20% of the British income. The third decile had also an income which is about 20% and so forth. You see that actually the last decile on the right, the highest decile had an income which was only, I think 15% of the British. That means that essentially, not only were all the Chinese poorer than the British, but they were poor in a particular way that the very poorest in China were not so much behind. Really much closer to the present. We're actually moving to the time of the Chinese Revolution. And what is striking there is now that everybody's China is extremely poor compared to everybody in England, and there is really no difference. So, in other words, people who are in the bottom decile in China are only one tenth of real income of the bottom people in the UK, and people who are at the top are actually also one tenth of the real income in the UK. So basically we have uh, in this picture, we see a, a significant deterioration in the relative position of China across the income distribution. And then finally, the, the line which is sort of in black color, which is upward sloping, shows you the situation more recently, I think 2013, where you see actually now, China being, of course, much better off than it was compared to England in 1950, uh, but poor people still be, being relatively poor compared to the poor people in England and the middle class and the richer people being actually gradually getting better off compared to their equivalents in England. Obviously, they're still not at the same level, but as you notice at the top of the income distribution, they're around 30% or 40% of the British income level. So this was essentially, I think, the story of this interaction 
between the West and Asia, which really determines a lot of the global income inequality over the last two, two centuries. When we start, we have lower incomes in Asia, but not really such lower incomes among the poor in Asia compared to the poor in Europe. Most of the inequality really comes from the fact that the European rich were much richer than the Asian rich. Then by the 1950, after more than a century, actually a century and a half of colonialism and Western dominance, you have actually everybody in China at extremely low level of income compared to their, to their counterparts in the UK. And then with, with the return to Asia, to the sort of prominence, we have a change now, which shows, of course, improvement at every part of the income distribution in China, but especially improvement at the top. So this is basically how the, the, the Chinese sort of uh, uh, catch up has been uh, playing in the last two centuries and how we can see it in the income distribution data. A different way also to see now global inequality is now to look only at what happened to GDPs per capita without looking at the internal distribution within the countries. Now, this slide here shows you uh, the, the blue bar shows you the mean the GDP per capita of the world. And basically, it is obviously adjusted for population between the countries. And what you see here, of course, is a significant increase in the GDP per capita of the world from the 19, after the World War II, basically, you have this really significant increase in the blue bar. On the other hand, what is also interesting here is to look at a, a red line. The red line gives you the coefficient of variation of GDP GDP per capita of the world, countries in the world. You notice that line more or less, of course it is lots of zigzags, but that line is going up. So the, line, the fact that it's going up means that the coefficient of variation, or if you will, behind the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation of GDP per capita, is getting larger, meaning that the, the, the uh, heterogeneity of the uh, GDP per capita is increasing. Or differently put in economic growth, it means that essentially the, 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 uh, there is a divergence of GDP per capita. Well, that divergence, as you notice here, really stops at one point, and this is at the end of the 20th century with the rise of Asia. So in the most recent period, I'm talking, of course, before the corona crisis, we have had continued growth in of the world GDP, but the decline in the coefficient of variation of GDP per capita. So in other words, we have had growth of the world continuing, but divergence in mean incomes going down. So it is a very important phenomenon which actually we have seen. So finally, let me then focus on the last 30 years in the world, which are called the greatest reshuffle of individual income positions since the Industrial Revolution. Now, why that was the case, I think you already see now, because with the rise of Asia, the incomes, the positions are being reshuffled. And let me explain in, a, I think, simplest possible way how it is being reshuffled. Throughout the two centuries that we talked about, uh, the West, West European countries, in North America and later Japan, really took the top 20 to 25 percent of the global income distribution. So practically everybody from those countries was in the top 20 to 25 percent of the global income distribution. What happens with the rise of China and Asia? You have people now from those countries, and of course there are lots of people from those countries, who enter into that area of the top 20 percent. So think of the pack of cards that you have in front of you and you have 100 cards and for simplicity, let's say the, the top 20 cards are all from different West European countries and North America. Well, now with the rise of China, some of this position of these cards is going to go down and some people from China would enter into this top 20%. So now what we are actually seeing there is really this change in global income positions. 
And this is, I think, one of the reasons why uh, there is so much dissatisfaction with the position of the middle class in Western countries. It is simply because their income levels are not growing fast or growing actually at the rate much slower than the top of their country's income distributions, but they are also being replaced in the global order, pecking order, by people from Asia. I will show you that even you know, uh, better in a, in a few slides, but without reading what is now on this slide, you can read it yourself. Um, this basically shows that the period between 1978 and 1991 was really the watershed years where many of the changes started, obviously with the changes in China with Deng Xiaoping, then Margaret Thatcher, Reagan, Mitterrand, Gonzalez, Gorbachev, liberalization of India. So essentially in little over 10 years, you had about 60% of the world population that began to live under a different, somewhat different, or sometimes like in the case of the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, entirely different economic system. Now, what the, the, the result of all of this has, what, is, has, what can we see on the global income distribution? Looking differently, you see here comparison between 1988 and 2011. Notice what is strikingly different in 2011 distribution is that you have a very thick group in the middle. So in other words, bef before, and we are talking about 1980s, you had what was called twin peaks. You had lots of people at relatively low income level, which were mostly people from large Asian countries. And then you had a small peak at relatively high income level where the Western countries were. Now you see this middle, which on the, on the red distribution, which did not exist in the 1980s. It did became much thicker. So this middle is now much thicker. You have actually there people from Asia and the people whom I call the global middle class, most of whom are from Asia. Now, that global middle class should not be confused by the middle class in the Western sense or the Russian sense, because the, the, the middle class in the West and in Russia are actually richer than what we call here the global middle class. It is really the global median class. These are people who are around the middle of the global income distribution, whose incomes are not very high by standards of the richer countries, and they range between three and $16 per day. So these are not really sort of middle class in the Western sense, but they are middle class in the global sense because they're around the, the middle of the income distribution. And of course, they, they have become much more numerous than they were. Uh, to see the same change, I, you know, I will use this graph that has become quite popular and famous of the elephant chart that shows you on the horizontal axis position of each percentile in the global income distribution and on the vertical axis how much real income has gone of that percentile over the period 1988-2008. And uh, basically I'll show you in a minute also how it goes up all the way to 2013. So what is important here is to know, uh, look at three points. One where you had in the middle which they call the China's middle class you had a very significant increase in real incomes in that group of people. The second group of people on the bottom are what I call the US lower middle class. These are people who are richer than of course people in China, but they had no growth. So this is the major contradiction. And I think that's why the graph became very popular because it really shows you the major contradiction which has existed in the last 20 years um, and which probably has led to lots of dissatisfaction with the political and economic system in the West. And that was the fact that the middle classes in those countries, and it's not only the United States, it's also China, Japan, France, did not really have much of growth in real terms. And in some sense, they feel under the pressure because of the competition through outsourcing or through imports, of the Asian middle classes that are still poorer, but actually are catching up and growing fast. And final point at the very end of the graph 
shows you the position of the global top 1%. Now, what is interesting about them is that in that period from 1988 to 2008, they actually had a period of very high growth and they did extremely well. So essentially, if you want to summarize the graph, you could say there are two parts of the global income distribution that in the period of high globalization before the financial crisis did extremely well. Asian middle classes and the top 1%. So you have the global plutocracy doing very well and you have globally relatively poor people but who are getting out of poverty doing very well. But people who are not doing very well are people from the rich countries, lower parts of the income distribution. And again, you can see the sort of difficult position of this lower part of the income distribution in the US, or as I said before, uh, you know, Japan or the UK, because not only are they being really competing with Asia, they are also seeing in their own countries that the top 1% is doing very well, these people are growing overall that period. They grew by about 80% in real terms, whereas they, they themselves, the middle class, grew at close to zero. So this, I think, in nutshell, illustrated all the issues uh, which we became aware of with the financial crisis. Now, the next slide is actually from the more recent work that they did, which looked at the period after the crisis. I go here only up to 2013 because I don't have, I'm actually working on the more recent data. The issue is that these data are based, you know, I show you one slide, it doesn't look that much. But the data to get this slide, you have to have from about 100 to 140 countries, you have to have household surveys, and you have to have micro data, and then you have to essentially sort of you know, compile and put together all this micro data and derive the global income distribution. The issue, of course, is that the data for many countries become available with a very big time lag. So essentially, you are being driven by the slowest countries in order to produce you know, global income distribution. So how did it change after the crisis? Notice two things really did not change much. The very strong growth around the global median remained. This is, again, the Asian incomes that have really continued growing quite strongly. And then also, there was no improvement for Western middle classes. And I would say actually for political reasons, and when I actually mentioned political implications in the title, this is one of the top political implications. It's essentially lack of growth of Western middle class incomes. And this is something now that has been going on for more than three decades. And of, of course, with this crisis, which is a very special crisis that has become even worse, but we basically can see the situation where this particular type of uh, uh, people like Western middle classes uh, really have no growth for almost two generations. So it is a big issue. Now you notice that there is one change compared to the previous period is that the crisis did affect also the global top 1%. You notice that the global top 1%, even after we are just for the underestimation, of the global top 1% has very low growth. So until 2013, the top 1%, the global rich, have not recovered from the effects of the crisis. I think that actually, if we were to extend this to 2018, we would actually see the improvements because I think the global top 1% has improved after that. So let me then go with this very briefly because I have to finish soon. Uh, just to show you uh, the continued catch up of Asia, which is actually shown here by the growth rates relative, I mean, growth rates of different continents, both coming from household surveys that measure income according to the household survey definitions and according to the G, and then in the blue line, in a red line, uh, is the, according to the GDP per capita. What you notice here, particularly for Asia, you notice actually that the cumulative growth over these five years was whether by GDP per, per capita or household service, about 40%. Uh, this is about, you know, 7% per year. 
On the other hand, if you look at this group of countries here, which is called WINAO, or Western Europe, North America, and Oceania, you see they actually, they had no growth. So essentially the, the, the catch up of Asia continued uh, and Latin America and to some extent Eastern Europe continued after the financial crisis. Now, let me just finally look at the composition of the global top 1% because that's actually quite interesting. Now we are looking here, not at the billionaires and not at the people who are actually on the Forbes list because these people are not going to be participating in household surveys. We don't expect them to be there because there are also very few of them. So when you have a household survey, like in the United States, that takes about 50,000 households, you are not going to find Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos here. Nor in Russia, when you have a household survey, you're not going to find uh, billionaires in Russia in the survey. But you're going to find in the top of your national distributions, affluent people with fairly high income levels on average, like to be on a, in, to be in a global top 1%, you have to have something around $70,000 after tax per capita. So in other words, this is a significant amount for a family of four. That means that actually you would have to have almost $300,000 after tax. So who are the people in the global top 1%? The U.S. still absolutely dominates. As you can see here, these are the numbers in millions. The global top 1% has about 74 million people. Now, uh, uh, 32 million of these 74, which is, you know, almost one half, are people from the United States. So essentially, the global top 1% is still very strongly dominated by, by Americans. Now, however, there are other countries, in particular China, that you can see here now having a very significant presence of about 4 million people, which means 5% of the global top 1%. Russia is there as well. And then as you can see Germany and Japan also with very large percentages. Uh, if you look at individual countries and countries which la largest percentage of their own population in the global top 1% are countries like Switzerland and Singapore, which are small, obviously, so they're not going to be in, in absolute terms very much represented, but something like 15% of their populations are in the global top 1%. And then finally, let me present you this slide, which actually let me do it like this, which is better when I, if I could show it with, uh, uh, maybe that would be the last slide that I want to present ideally with, yes, I think it's possible to do it with each individual country coming in so that you can see really things sort of better. Uh, this shows you the, let me just start with the United States. So this shows you the position on the horizontal axis of each US percentile in the global income distribution, in the national income distribution on the horizontal axis and the, the position of that same percentile in the global income distribution. So let's start from the bottom. There are people who are at the second or third US percentile. They are obviously the poorest people in the US. But if you look at their position in the global income distribution on the vertical axis, they are at the number around 60, as you can see. So in other words, even the very poorest people in the US are richer than half of the world population. So they're above the, the, you know, the global median. As you go higher, obviously people become in the US, they are of course at higher point in the national income distribution and they're at a higher point of the global income distribution. And when you look at the very top, you see that the top 11% of the American income distribution are in the global top 1%. Okay, so this is how it looks for the rich country. Now let's look here at China. So notice obviously China at any point in the distribution is going to be below the US, but at the very top, the Chinese top 1% in the urban areas is actually also part of the global top 1%. But the poor people in China are only at the 30th percentile globally. Then I introduce here rural China you notice that huge gap between urban and rural China. You see people in rural China who are at a, a global 
10th percentile. So in other words, they're very, very low in the global income distribution, the poorest people in rural China. But you also have to remember that you might notice that the, the person who is at the median 50th percentile in rural China is also at the global median. And the person who is at the Chinese urban median is at around 70th percentile in the world. And then of course, the, the richer people in Chinese rural areas are obviously there at around 90th percentile globally. So this is now urban India. Now, urban India, which is actually quite striking, is still poorer than rural China because it is at every point, it is below rural China, except at the very top where of course, urban India has very rich people and these rich people are in the top 1% globally. Uh, but notice very, very low position of the poor people in urban India who are actually among the poorest people in the world. Uh, this, this is the, the uh, uh, rural India where you essentially have obviously a much poorer situation uh, than in the urban India and even the people who are at the 50th percentile in rural India are only at around 20th percentile globally. And finally, a country that could kind of uh, mimic the world, which would have very poor people at the bottom, which would have significant uh, middle class and upper middle class, and that would have a presence in the global top 1%. Uh, uh, it's a country which of course high inequality because in order to mimic global income distribution, you have to have very high inequality. And this, the, the country that is here is Brazil, but I could have equally presented South Africa there as well. So this is how uh, basically uh, you can see global income distribution, not only as the distribution as we normally see it, of GDP per capita or mean incomes of the countries, you can see it as combination of mean income of the countries and inequalities within nation states. So for example, just let me give you last example with which I'll finish. Look at the intersection between Brazil and urban China. So Brazil is always like lower than urban China at the given percentile of income distribution. <laughs> but then, then around the 80th percentile, Brazil overtakes urban China. So in other words, people in the, at the very top 20% in Brazil are richer than people at the very top at the, uh, of, the, of urban China. So you have this you know, uh, intersection where you actually have, uh, you notice then basically higher inequality in Brazil pushes the people at the top above the people in China. Then I had, well, I, I'm actually, sorry, this is actually, there was some change in the slides, but I have, if I can actually, maybe during the question and answer, I would like to share another slide where actually I have Russia on the same sort of a graph, like what I've just shown you. Um, and uh, there you would actually see, maybe I can see, you would see the position of Russia, which is very close to the position of urban China. So maybe I think actually, since I've actually spoken for, you know, enough time, maybe I should stop here and uh, then it would give you a chance maybe to ask questions and to have a little bit of a conversation. So thank you again for your attention. As I said, it would have been better if I were in Moscow and if we were all in one same place, but, you know, given the situation, this is obviously the best we could do. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you, uh, uh, Branko. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. We have few questions, uh, and uh, I would uh, we are, we have, look the chat. You have written two questions from Marek and from Vamel, uh, and um, I have a couple of my of mine. Uh, and one is, um, of course, on transition, because I remember your book of uh, 1998 from the World yes. Bank. 
In, in, and actually, this book I quoted 20 years ago uh, because you mentioned that Russia moved uh, to mean 50% uh, on the poverty rate by 1994. So maybe you could comment uh, on, well, we know everything from Russia, <laughs> but if you could say something about Russia, it would be nice. But basically, I'm interested what is happening in East Europe. Uh, so let me, I mean, uh, Leonie, thank you for the question. Let me show you, I mean, I hope you see now with the uh, uh, screen sharing, this is the slide where I actually wanted to bring Russia in the yes. same yes, structure. Please. So you see here, uh, this is the same slide, like the last one that I've just shown, except now that I bring Russia and I bring China as a whole country, not China as rural and urban. And also I have India as the whole country. So you see the position of Russia here. Russia is at every point of the income distribution above China. And the, at the very top, China, Russia, US, and uh, Brazil. And to, you know, they basically get united at the very top because at the very top of the income distribution, uh, the top 1% or actually in, in Russia, I think top 1% belongs to the global top 1%. Yeah, in, in here we China. have African countries. You are showing African. You are showing us African countries at the moment. I will ask you. Connection, 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 connection. Hello, Mashka. It looks like we. Ah, New York is. Ah, Branko, we lost you a minute ago. Branko, have you? Can you see? Uh, can you hear us? Hello? Uh, I should say uh, in the pause that New York is not reliable as a connection. Something happens in the American economy. PT. Mash, what would you say? I'm afraid that Branko has just left the meeting after you said that the economy is. <laughs> I, I just. <laughs> I have a couple of caricatures. Uh, it was an innocent question. That's right. Oh. In I New hope York. So he will rec reconnect in, in a minute. I hope so. Uh, I can see Professor. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah we, we do. Okay. Let me not put the slides anymore because I think that with slides and my uh, okay. video, okay. it does the whole thing just collapses. So uh, let's not put the slides. Okay, uh, complete verbal, no problem. So that's what I was saying actually. So it's essentially, okay, so you asked me the question. So I, I've shown you the situation of Russia. Russia is actually, as I said, very similar to, to urban China. Now, notice one thing, which of course the background is a little bit different. Uh, China uh, household income or household consumption is very low share of GDP, as you know. So in other words, the Chinese numbers in household surveys reflect that. So, you know, you have a Chinese uh, uh, consumption being about 40% of the household consumption, being 40% of the GDP. So in other words, the Chinese GDP is much higher than what we see actually as Chinese disposable income in the slides. 
Um, so that's what I would say for the positions of, of, of China and, and Russia. And, uh, you know, I have not done specifically East European countries, but of course I, I, I could do that because all the numbers are there. Uh, some of the countries obviously have, like Poland, for example, have in Estonia, have improved their position quite, quite uh, significantly. So can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, so at least we can have a conversation even without slides. Okay, please answer questions you see on which, in the chat. Well, I don't see anything. That's the problem. Ah, you can. Okay, okay. I will read for you. Maybe uh, you can just tell me what are the, the questions. No, okay. okay. Uh, Marek Dombrovsky uh, is asking. Hi, Marek. Uh, hi, Branko. Can you explain a large difference in two bars for Africa in slide 25? Yeah, it's a very good question, Marek. This is actually, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a puzzle. Uh, the two bars are actually one bar is uh, African or Asian or whatever uh, growth of income ha from household service. Another bar is from GDP per capita data. And you know things that actually in the case of Africa, we have for the same countries, for the countries that are included in the database, we have much lower growth according to, uh, to, to household service than to according to GDP per capita. I honestly don't know what is the reason. You know, we have had <clears throat> problems in Africa in the past that uh, that the level of not, not about growth rate, but the level of uh, of uh, uh, income from household service was higher than GDP per capita, and that led, I have to say, that led to the revision of some of African numbers. As you know, for example, Nigeria actually revised and Ghana revised their national accounts and actually increased their GDP per capita, partly because the household surveys were showing that actually incomes were higher. But to, to answer your question really clearly, I don't know what is the cause of the gap in the, in the African day. Well, second question in chat uh, from the person by name V-A-M-E-L, Vamel. Uh, Brancos, thanks, gorgeous. What is your take on dynamics of global wealth distribution and Branko, what is your point on the works of Thomas Piketty? Okay, on the on global uh, wealth distribution, you know, I've been following the, the papers uh, and, you know, it was done actually, now it's being done under the, the Credit Suisse report, but it is done by, you know, um, by people like uh, Jim Davis and Tony Shorex originally. Uh, so I simply follow what I read, what they write, you know, global wealth inequality, of course, it's much higher than global income inequality. But as you know, uh, wealth inequality within each country is greater than income inequality. So, you know, this, what we see at the global level, of course, is a Gini probably, I remember, if I remember correctly, more than 85. And of course, in, in terms of income, we are talking about Gini, which is now about 65. So there's big difference. Uh, between the two. So the wealth inequality is extraordinarily high. And as you know, Oxford and uh, Oxford, uh, Oxfam every year, of course, makes a big point on comparing the, the wealth of the top 10% or 10 people or 15 people and the top uh, the, at the bottom 50%. Um, uh, Piketty, I, uh, I actually think that he has, actually, you know, been extremely good influence. He has transformed really the, uh, the work on inequality in the sense that he has brought many things himself, not only in the capital in the 21st century, but even before that, you know, his book on the top incomes in France, which was published in 2001, like, you know, 12 years before the, the capital in the 21st century. And because of the success of that book, he has also brought an incredible large number of researchers and young people. So we are basically now having, you know, maybe 20, 30, maybe even 50 people, young people who are doing extremely interesting research on different types of inequality, which without him and actually without the success of that book, we would not have had. So, you know, he was definitely a, a transformative figure in the terms of uh, uh, work on inequality. Okay, uh, yeah, Branko, as far as I understand, Credit Suisse 
uh, doesn't take uh, the uh, value of houses. So it's with wealth distribution, mostly financial assets, right? Yes, that's true, that's true. That's important part because it's not exactly wealth, it's financial wealth. No, so, no, you're right, actually, it's financial yeah. wealth. It is not, yes, yes. Yeah, it makes everything understandable. Second, uh, I, I have one, uh, uh, I would say, obligatory question. Uh, question because we, of course, discussed today mostly recession of 2020, uh, COVID effect, and we uh, stride forward. Uh, question: uh, It's interesting because I give in the morning some explanation of my own, but it's interesting to have a pure test uh, from you. Uh, do you think that current events, current events for 2020, increasing or decreasing social inequality? It, ah. it's, it, yeah. It's such a difficult question. You know, it's difficult because we are in the midst of the crisis. We don't know when it would end. We don't know how it would affect, you know, different countries yet. But let me say what I think that we know so far. And let me do, divide the question in two parts. Going back to what I presented about global inequality between countries and then within countries. Now between countries, what we know is that China and East Asia have done much better than the West this year. And that would probably carry on for at least another year or two. Now, if you now think of global inequality, you immediately see that that should reduce global inequality because precisely because of the effect of China. But there is one but there, very important one. And that but is India. India has more recently become a much more important force for reduction of global inequality because India is poor. So when India grows up, global inequality is reduced. China has now come to a position where actually China is neutral to global inequality because China is sufficiently rich that when it starts growing faster now, it's actually adding to global inequality. So that's where this whole difficulty lies because India actually is doing, because of COVID, quite poorly. So I would not be surprised that global inequality with, between components, actually despite the fact that Asia has done well, that the between component goes up. On top of that, it could be, so the second part, within countries, the general presumption is that the within countries inequality will increase because of the unemployment which has hit more people with so-called essential occupations that are relatively in the lower part of the income distribution so that within inequality might increase as well. That also is not totally clear because you have had in the first uh, uh, and now in Europe in the second sort of a wave of uh, wage compensations you had actually, in some cases, overcompensation, that people actually received higher wages or incomes than their wages. So even that is not quite clear, but it seems to me, it seems now that more of the evidence is towards an increased inequality than the opposite. Yes, uh, now, that's, uh, now my point on this, very simple. Uh, the fifth quintile, uh, got forced savings, forced savings, yes, just true. because we couldn't spend. And so we uh, we moving to financial markets and real estate. So we are using, say we have uh, international real estate boom uh, in Russia as well. And so we are using savings for grabbing things uh, at the opportunity. And, uh, and compensation is only for current um, uh, milk and butter. Uh, so probably inside, I mean, developed countries, I cannot tell about China or India, I mean, Europe uh, mostly or United States. I believe we have currently more in, uh, inequality because rich people are really actually easily uh, uh, adapting to the situation. But anyway, it's interesting time. Uh, and I believe that a lot of PhD, uh, dissert uh, PhD, uh, 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 dissertation uh, could be re rewritten in the uh, next few years. So, Professor, we will not without a job of rewriting everything. 
Yes, let me have, you know, here is Igor ask a very good question. So let me, you, should I, because I saw it now on my slide. It says inequality has become a hot topic in research and in political agenda. But do we really see any significant developments in policies regarding inequality worldwide, both within and between countries? I think, and what are my expectations? I actually think it's an excellent question because this is something that I find really puzzling is that since at least the, the financial crisis, this is now 12 years, we have had an incredible number of papers on inequality, books on inequality, you know, conferences, discussions in the political arena and everywhere. But if you put down for the rich countries, like what were the measures really taken to reduce inequality, to you know, increase incomes of the middle class or the incomes of the poor, whatever. You really, I think, basically end up with nothing. Nothing, absolutely and nothing. Really, and in other, or, or what you end up with, you actually, with the Trump reduction of taxes at the top, you actually have the opposite effects. If you look at flexibilization of labor under Macron in France, you have the opposite effect. So we have a really a total extraordinary disconnect between what we, what everybody says we should do and we write these things and we discuss and a total absence of action in the political arena. Right. Which I find quite extraordinary. And, uh, I, you know, as I said, it's really, you know, it, it really requires political scientists to explain how this apparent demand has absolutely not met by any policy. Right. Uh, so that's actually, you know, I like this uh, question by Igor because it is, it is a puzzle to me. I think it's a puzzle to many that we have had so little actually action in a policy sphere despite all of this talk. Uh, Branko, let me add one grenade to your uh, <laughs> uh If you look into sustainable development goals, uh, goal number 10, inequality, between countries and social inequality, there is no indicators, no targets, nothing. Uh, I just finished one uh, work which addressing, so I'm trying to say if you have a good climate in Europe uh, and plus two billion poor people in the world, are you going to be happy about it regardless of the current recession and COVID? No, you know, the, the current recession is such a sort of a, a merely extraordinary event. Nobody could have sort of imagined it. But one thing which I, I, I would like also to mention uh, in, the, in answer to your question, and I didn't have time to speak about that, is really the role of Africa. And, the, you know, it's the only continent with a significant increase of population in the next 50 years. And Africa... Should, in principle, ideally should replicate what happened in Asia in the latter part of the 20th century and now. But to do that, Africa would have really to have growth rates on, you know, average around seven to eight percent because of the two and a half percent of population growth and about five and a half percent of per capita growth. These growth rates are really very hard to attain. So it seems to me, and I don't want to sort of be prophet of the doom, but it seems to me that Africa will continue to decline in terms of per capita position with respect to the rest of the world, which then, of course, would mean that increasing global inequality, but also another political consequence about which I write in my book is migration. And I think that's the issue that I always emphasize in Europe, uh, Europe uh, really is do dealing with migration from one summer to the next. But the migration is a secular issue because the, the level of income, the, the difference between the northern shore, or shore, northern coast of the Mediterranean and the southern shore is enormous. It has never been so big in history. So you cannot expect that people are not going to travel in order to increase their incomes by 10 times. And I think this is a big issue. And I, I actually also think last, last point on that, that Europe, in my opinion, is wrong in not actually helping or working together with China on Belt and Road Initiative to help Africa grow. Because the European interest is really growth in Africa for the reasons of migration that I mentioned.
So no, I, I, I think that this is a big right. issue, I think. Right. I have studied African problems in the context of South African presidency in BRICS. I see. Uh -huh. And other issues. Uh, the problem is that we uh, lagging behind Asia in terms of st political stability and uh, physical infrastructure. We, we don't have roads and we have too many uh, nation, independent sovereign nations on one river, even for uh, some development. So it's, it will be a difficult problem. Uh, and the uh, issue we have all the time uh, meetings with Europeans, uh, we probably, uh, it looks like they believe if they have uh, good climate policy, in Europe, uh, it will give them good climate in Europe. <laughs> what is probably yeah. that for? <laughs> but well, and investing in last percentage of emission in Europe instead of investing uh, in coal in Africa or India, it's some, it's some kind of a cognitive dissonance. Uh, but anyway, returning to our, if you, um, uh, on tra in transition, uh, on inequality after transition in the East Central Europe. We have few numbers uh, for last decade, which uh, gives indication that maybe it's a bit improving. I mean, uh, less inequality after the financial crisis, a little bit better. What do you think? Why is it? You know, I didn't, I actually remember some of those uh, numbers. Uh, basically, I, let me just put it like that. Basically, if you look at Europe, uh, you know, East Europe, West Europe, whatever, all of Europe, uh, there has not been much of a change <coughs> in inequality uh, in the last 15 years. It's essentially stable with some small changes. Uh, of course, what has happened is the different countries have had very different real income effects because of the crisis. You had countries like Greece, for example, and Italy, and the Netherlands also, which had, because of the crisis, they had the decline in real income throughout the whole distribution. But then you had countries <coughs> like Poland, which actually did not have a decline at any part of the distribution. They actually had growth at all parts of distribution, despite the recession, the global recession in 2007 and eight uh, and nine, actually 2008 and nine. Um, so. Uh, I, I, you know, Central Europe is uh, now, in terms of genies, is one of the most equal parts of the world. You know, you have countries like Slovenia, there are five of them, uh, Slovenia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, um, and Austria, that have very low inequality, and they have really, with the Nordic countries, the lowest inequality in the world. Of course, they are very small societies, very homogeneous, highly educated, uh, no obvious differences, whether it was ethnic, religious, or any other. So they are actually, you know, having low inequality and large social transfers. Again, as you know, from the, you know, Czech Republic and Slovakia have inherited a very sort of, you know, transfer driven system, even from the past. They have continued doing that. Austria is likewise, you know, very a homogeneous society with large transfers. Slovenia also. So this is how these countries in Central Europe look like now. Uh, Poland, of course, has a high inequality. Uh, obviously, Russia has much higher inequality. Ukraine is a little of a puzzle for me. I have honestly to say that I'm doubtful about some of the numbers because Ukraine in um, official numbers shows one of the lowest inequalities in the world. Uh, and uh, I, I just cannot uh, see that Ukraine can have so much lower inequality, and I have not actually had microdata for Ukraine, but so much lower inequality than Russia. It just doesn't seem to me very plausible. Uh, I think there must be something, I guess, this is a guess, uh, some problems with the surveys and with people who are being surveyed. Uh, so that's for, for, uh, for Ukraine. So that's basically, and then for, you know, Southeast Europe, uh, we have actually relatively high inequalities in Serbia and Montenegro, which is a little bit of a puzzle for me as well, but they do show now, you know, not once, but in a several surveys, they show high inequality. 
Okay. Uh, uh, Branko, thank you. I have one uh, unanswered question. Let me read it for you. Uh, from professor of Moscow State University, Andrei Markov. Uh, Branko, hi. Good to hear. Uh, good to see right. you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you. I, you were uh, mostly covered, but now I could see you. Ask yes, yourself, please. Andrei. Uh, yes, uh, the question actually is a follow-up to uh, the question from Igor and your response that at the moment you don't see any uh, real uh, po policies uh, uh, of anti-inequality type. Fine, but what could be those measures in reality? What's the spectrum? Maybe the puzzle is also in the fact that these measures don't have political sustainability or attractiveness. Andre, I agree with you. Let me just put it like that. I can give you the measures in, in one minute, although, but I do think that there is one issue that, uh, the, in my opinion, the left has not been able to grapple with. If we go back to the period, and we are old, I mean, at least I'm old to remember, at the period of the uh, big change that I call the watershed, where Margaret Thatcher and Reagan came, with entirely different policies. There was a very clear package, which became the neoliberal package. It was very clear. It was not in all respects good, but it was clear. We do not have an equivalent anti-neoliberal package now. And I think that's one of the issues that, that, that it is not packaged in a very clear way. But of course, what could be done, uh, you know, in the, I mean, maybe, you know, I know US case better, but what can be done is increased tax rates, especially on high incomes, higher taxes on capital than, you know, than it is the case now, because now capital is taxed at a lower rate than labor. You have seen that not only, you know, with Trump who has paid nothing, but you even see other people like, for example, you know, the future president, uh, he had an average tax rate of 30% with an income which was more than a million. It is a low tax, actually, like 30%. If you have an income over a million, it's a low tax. Uh, then the inheritance taxation, then uh, public schooling, which I think is, is very important, uh, uh, the, the minimum wage. So you do have uh, lots of policies that you could actually start implementing from taxation of current income and taxation of wealth and inheritance to proactive policies of the minimum wage, retraining, uh, uh, very high, even there was like in, I mean, San Francisco was the first city that implemented a special tax on companies that have a huge gap in earnings between the top and the bottom. You know, so that actually you, you, you cannot have, I think more than 300 times the gap between the top and the bottom. So there are really policies that could be done, but there is clearly no political support for those policies uh, anywhere. And practically nothing has been done. So that's my, you know, as, as I said, for political scientists, it's an interesting question. Why is that, that there is no political support for such policies? Well, okay, uh, the political, political problem is not for us. Thanks God, at least we are not responsible. That's <laughs> them, that's politicians, these elites, this one percentage point of uh, oligarchs, they prevent everything. Uh, it's pity Karl Marx dead, but thanks God we have Piketty <laughs> and so on and so on. Anyway, uh, uh, Branko, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. If you could, could send us um, uh, a presentation, we could put it uh, with your uh, lecture. Uh, I think I already sent it to Masha, but of course I will send it right, again. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yes, we have it. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, okay. You. Because in this case, we can decipher your text by uh, presentation or vice versa. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm sorry that uh, the connection was not, uh, you know, in, in, in Washington, my connection is much better. But here, I noticed yesterday, it was a little bit iffy, but at least we were able to have a conversation. Uh, very nice to see you. Uh, keep in touch. Uh, I will send you a couple of things again uh, on the topic we discussed today. 
on Monday. Thank you, and I hope to see you either here or in Moscow. Very good. See thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. It's still late for you. Igor, and you can say for final far away. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you very much. Thank you, Branko. And actually, it was the, the last event during our conference. And uh, that's why uh, it's time to say some conclusion yeah. words. Actually, I, I wanted to thank uh, uh, everyone who participated in, in this event, and especially those who, who spoke uh, during it, especially those who made presentation. And so, of course, all the participants, uh, all those people who asked a lot of uh, interesting, com complicated and uh, thought-provoking questions. Uh, yes, I also want to thank uh, Maria, who uh, made tremendous efforts to uh, make all this happen uh, because uh, actually she she was a major organizer of, of all this uh, yes and I hope uh, to see uh, all of you uh, next year because this conference is eight annual conference on the global economy but they will be the ninth uh, it's for sure I hope that it will be offline uh, or in some uh, combined formats, uh, but not, not fully online, but uh, it is uh, already not, not the question to us, but uh, to, to the pandemic. But, uh, but I, I, hope, I hope that we uh, will uh, meet uh, together next year as well. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Len, thanks for driving this process. Fantastic.